Hey, welcome back to Critical Thinking and to Categorical Logic. Up to this point, we've been laying the groundwork, but today we're finally going to dive in and start to put the pieces together as we begin to analyze categorical arguments in the form of syllogisms. I know you can't wait, so why don't we go ahead and jump in and get started. There are different kinds of syllogisms, categorical being simply the first type that we're going to explore. If you've never heard of a syllogism, it's a standard form of deductive argument where a conclusion is inferred from two premises. The categorical syllogism specifically is one consisting of three categorical propositions and containing exactly three terms total. Each term maintains the same meaning throughout the argument, and each term appears in exactly two of the propositions. Remember, any categorical proposition will contain only two terms, a subject and a predicate. Take a look at this example. Premise one, no logicians are people who embrace contradiction. Premise two, some teachers are people who embrace contradiction. And our conclusion, therefore, some teachers are not logicians. Logicians appears twice in premise one and in the conclusion. Teachers appears twice in premise two and the conclusion. And people who embrace contradiction also appears twice once in each premise. Now our goal is to be able to analyze a categorical syllogism to see if it's valid, structured in such a way that if the premises are true, the conclusion couldn't possibly be false. But before we can do this, we need to understand another new concept, and that's distribution. And although some people find this a bit tricky, it's actually pretty simple if you memorize two things. One, what we mean by distribution, and two, the pattern of distribution among the four proposition types. So what is distribution? It's an attribute of a term, subject, or predicate in a categorical proposition describing its relationship to the entire class denoted. A term is distributed when it refers to the entire class. Otherwise, the term is undistributed. But notice, it's the terms that have distribution. They're distributed or undistributed. Propositions don't. They have quantity, universal or particular. For example, all Raimi films are films including an Oldsmobile Delta 88. The proposition is universal in quantity. The term Raimi films is distributed. Now when it comes to the subject term, distribution is easy to identify since we have a nice little quantifier right up front telling us if the term applies to the entire class. The subject's distributed when it follows the quantifier all or no, and undistributed if it follows the quantifier sum. Unfortunately, we don't get a clue for the predicate. Is films including an Oldsmobile Delta 88 distributed or not? Are we talking about all films including an Oldsmobile Delta 88? If you think about it for a second, you can figure it out, but it's easier to just memorize the pattern. Here are the rules. Universals distribute their subjects, and negatives distribute their predicates. A universal affirmative has a distributed subject only. So all A is somewhere in B. A universal negative has both a distributed subject and a distributed predicate. So E, none of A, is anywhere in B. A particular affirmative has nothing distributed. Some of A is somewhere in B. And a particular negative has a distributed predicate only. Some of A is not anywhere in B. This modified square could serve as a good study aid. On the top, we have the distributed subjects, and on the right, the distributed predicates. Let's look at these particulars and think about the distribution of their predicates. Some werewolves are better at basketball than lacrosse. Out of those people better at basketball, we're only saying some of them are werewolves. But with some members of the Justice League are not shape-shifting telepaths, we're making a claim about the entire class of shape-shifting telepaths, namely that it excludes people like Batman. Okay, a bit more terminology and then we'll be ready to test validity. When looking at a categorical syllogism, we need to know more than the subject and predicate terms of each proposition. These very terms have other names depending on their location in the syllogism overall. They're designated the major, minor, and middle terms. A lone proposition doesn't have a major, minor, or middle term, but a syllogism does. And here's how you can identify them. The major term is the predicate of the conclusion. And since each term appears twice, the premise containing it is called the major premise. 
The minor term is the subject of the conclusion, and it appears in the minor premise. And that exhausts the terms in the conclusion. The remaining term is the middle term, and it occurs in both premises only, not in the conclusion. And in a way, it's the most important term of the argument structurally because it's what links the premises and enables inference to a conclusion. Take a look at this syllogism again. Premise 1, no logicians are people who embrace contradiction. Premise 2, some teachers are people who embrace contradiction. Conclusion, therefore some teachers are not logicians. We start by looking at the conclusion. The predicate is our major term. That would be logicians. So premise 1 must be the major premise since it contains the major term. The subject of the conclusion is our minor term, so it would be teachers. Thus premise 2 is the minor premise, and people who embrace contradiction has to be the middle term. Now that we have all the puzzle pieces in place, testing validity is going to be a matter of applying four simple rules. Rule 1. The syllogism must contain only three terms. Any more and we have a problem. Breaking the rule means the argument commits a fallacy known as the fallacy of equivocation. It's also known as the four-term fallacy. For example, all women are smart, all queens are monarchs, therefore what? All queens are smart? We can't really get there from here. This makes no sense because the terms in premise 2 never connect to those in premise 1. Unfortunately, it's not always this obvious. Here's an example where the fallacy is a bit harder to catch. All heroes are demigods. Martin Luther King Jr. is a hero, therefore Martin Luther King Jr. is a demigod. This looks valid, so what's the problem? Aren't there only three terms? Well, no. Actually, there are four. The word hero is being used equivocally. Equivocation, remember, is when a meaning of a word changes. In premise one, hero has a mythical Greek definition, a person with a god for a parent, literally a godparent. In premise two, hero is being used in a fully modern sense, somebody willing to sacrifice themselves for the sake of others, perhaps. So the four terms are demigods, MLK, hero one, and hero sense two. We can even illustrate how the fallacy affects the form of an argument by looking at the function of the middle term. It serves to connect the major term with the minor term. If we have four terms, we have no middle term, and no connection can actually take place. Rule two, the middle term must be distributed at least once, which means the middle term must refer to the entire class in one or both premises. If it doesn't, again, we have no guarantee that the major and minor terms are going to touch each other. Failure to distribute the middle term is called the fallacy of illicit middle. For example, all Baptists are baptized. All Catholics are baptized. Therefore, all Catholics are Baptists. We can tell this argument doesn't work, and now we can actually say why. Baptized is the middle term. But both premises are A propositions, universal affirmatives, so have undistributed predicates. This example wouldn't fool anybody, but you'd be surprised at how often people fall for arguments with this exact form when different terms are used. The Democratic Party supports health care reform, socialists support health care reform, so the Democratic Party is socialist. We could illustrate the problem this way. And you can see the major and minor terms could be floating around inside the middle term and never actually bump into each other, so we have no idea how they might relate. Rule three, any term distributed in the conclusion must be distributed in the premises. Now perhaps there are no distributed terms in the conclusion, that's fine. It merely states that if there are, then the same term must also be distributed where it occurs in the premises. If this rule is violated, the argument commits either of two fallacies. Fallacy of illicit major, if the major term is distributed in the conclusion but not in the premise, and fallacy of illicit minor, if the minor term is distributed in the conclusion but not in the premise. The reason why this is a problem is because you cannot infer all of something from some of something. Just because some Beatles songs are great doesn't mean they all are. Here's an example. We haven't talked about dogs yet, so all dogs are mammals. No cats are dogs, therefore no cats are mammals. Which fallacy is this? 
Just take a look at our conclusion. It's an E, a universal negative, which means it has both a distributed subject and predicate. So we have to check each. Let's start with cats, our subject and the minor term. Is it distributed in the minor premise? Yes, it is. It's also an E. So far, so good. What about mammals, the predicate and the major term? Is it distributed in the major premise? Uh-oh, it's an A. And mammals is the predicate. That's a problem. A's don't distribute their predicates. So we have an illicit major. And our final rule, which may sound complicated, but it's actually first grade mathematics, the number of negative claims in the premises must be the same as the number of negative claims in the conclusion. Now watch how simple this is. The conclusion is always a single claim. It's one proposition. This implies that the conclusion cannot be valid if there are two negative premises, each premise being a single claim as well. So two negative premises equals two claims. It also implies that you can't get a negative conclusion from two affirmative premises. All we have to do is add up our negative premises and make sure we have the same number of negative conclusions. Now, try to keep up with this math problem. No war is meant to be fun. No government action is meant to be fun. So, no war is a government action. We have two negative claims as premises and one negative claim as a conclusion. So 1 plus 1 equals 1? No. There's our problem. Of course, if you can't add with numbers between 0 and 2, I probably can't help you. Notice also we have no problem with distribution, but both war and government action are excluded from the class of things meant to be fun, so we still have no idea how these two categories relate to each other. Using a simple example to illustrate, no beagle is a bird, no dog is a bird, so no beagle is a dog. All we know are beagles and dogs aren't birds. If we didn't know something about beagles independently, we'd have no idea how they relate to the class we call dogs. Now, let's test our skills. Let's check this argument for validity running backwards through the four rules. Peter loves Mary Jane. Harry loves Peter. So Harry loves Mary Jane. Remember, personal names can form a class of one, so we could treat all of these as type A propositions. Rule four, well, zero negative claims. Zero plus zero equals zero, check. Rule three, Harry in our conclusion is a distributed minor term, but it's also distributed above, check. Rule two, the middle term appears to be Peter, and Peter is distributed in the first premise, check again. And rule one, looks like we have three terms, Peter, Mary Jane, and Harry. It seems to pass our test, but this argument just sounds wrong. What did we miss? Talk about back to the basics. We have a translation problem. Translated correctly, this is our argument. All Peter is a person who loves Mary Jane. All Harry is a person who loves Peter. So all Harry is a person who loves Mary Jane. Maybe we should count our terms again. We have Peter, Harry, person who loves Mary Jane, and person who loves Peter. It actually does violate rule number one. It was just easy to hide. That's a good place to wrap up our discussion of categorical logic. But if you remember, there are other types of propositions besides categorical propositions. So next time, we're going to shift. And we're going to start to look at what we call propositional logic. And we're going to begin with the language that we call symbolese. So until then, take care, and I'll see you in the next video.